So I'd like to say good evening to everyone and welcome to our community conversation on healthcare. We're really excited to have the opportunity to share with you some of the initiatives that are happening throughout the province and in this community. My name is Nancy McConnell Maxner and I'll be the moderator for this evening. Um, and I have to say it's kind of fun being the moderator tonight at home. Um, we've been all over the province and so to actually have faces that I know is a nice, uh, nice experience. Um, I will say that this, I want to also mention that this portion of the evening will be recorded and it will be posted on the same website that you registered on so you can go back and watch it if you like or you can share it with people who did not have the opportunity to attend. The agenda for tonight will be uh, essentially uh, some formal remarks from our leadership team and then it's a question and answer period and I'll go over the, the, uh, that process in a few minutes. So right now I'd like to pass it along to the Honourable Pat Dunn. Minister of Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage and the MLA for Picto Centre. Uh, thanks, thanks, Nancy, and a uh, big welcome to everyone that we're able to uh, be here tonight. It's, uh, it's one of those informative nights and these discussions are so important. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I also want to acknowledge that people of African descent have helped shape the history and culture of Nova Scotia for over 400 years. And once again, these, uh, <clears throat> this group have been crisscrossing the province uh, for, for quite some time now and meeting community members, meeting uh, people from various communities, discussing um, health related issues. So again, I'm, I'm pleased to be here this evening to uh, listen to the proceedings. I'm certainly uh, very pleased to, uh, to welcome my colleague, the Health and Wellness Minister, the Honourable uh, Michelle Thompson. Now, uh, Michelle will not want me to say this, but I'm going to anyway. The, um, every, every caucus, regardless of what uh, party they're affiliated with, have a rock star. And our rock star is Minister Thompson, without a doubt. She is uh, well qualified for the position that she's in. We're so pleased to have her in our caucus. She's lived it, she's breathed it, she's experienced it. She's been at so many levels in the healthcare sector. So uh, again, uh, a big welcome to uh, the Honorable Michelle Thompson. Also uh, with us tonight is Health and Wellness uh, Deputy Minister Janine Lagasse, and of course, uh, Vice President of Operations for the Northern Zone, Bethany McCormick. The, um, once, once again, uh, it, it's already been explained approximately how, the way things will uh, work here tonight. You'll have a chance to ask some questions and so on. Once again, thank you for coming. I will uh, pass things over to our minister for uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks, Minister Dunn. Thanks, Pat. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure. He's uh, he set me up now. I have big shoes to fill, uh, so I hope I don't don't let anybody down. Um, so my name is Michelle Thompson. I am the MLA for Anaganish and the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, as Pat said, I am a, I'm a healthcare worker. I was a registered nurse, or am a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for 30 years, and I've had the opportunity to work throughout the system. And uh, prior to being elected uh, in 2021, I was the CEO of a long-term care facility. Um, that was my last gig before I was elected. So. Uh, when we formed government, we decided um, that we needed to immediately try and do things differently. We know that our healthcare system has been under strain for an incredibly long time. I felt that. I know that there are healthcare workers in the room tonight who felt that and, and know that deeply as well. And so one of the first things we did was create a health leadership team that for the very first time in our province included uh, Department of Health and Wellness and Nova Scotia Health. And so prior to uh, this health leadership team, these two entities moved in parallel. Department of Health and Wellness is the policymaker and the funder, and Nova Scotia Health was the operator. And uh, while they did have collaboration, it's not quite the same as what we're experiencing now. So these, uh, Janine Lagasse, the CEO, Karen Oldfield, uh, Janet Davidson is the administrator. She's really a thought leader in our country uh, in health and Dr. Kevin Oral, an orthopedic surgeon, sit on a weekly basis, well supported by people with expertise in, across the field uh, that require us to run health. And they, they meet and make decisions on a daily basis because what we know is that we need to move quickly. We need to be able to make decisions quickly. And this team has allowed us to do that. 
The second thing we did was we went out as a health leadership team, the Premier and myself. The Premier's no uh, stranger to you folks, I'm sure. Uh, and we started in Neils Harbour, and we went all the way to Yarmouth and as many stops as we could in between. And we spent a lot of time speaking with healthcare workers. We wanted to understand their experience. We wanted to understand what they felt the solutions are and how we could help. Where are the things that we could do quickly? What are the things that we needed to do kind of medium and long-term care? And, and as we've done that, we built uh, Action for Health. So that's a strategic plan for our health in this province. It's the first uh, plan that, that we've had in the province in over a dozen years. And this plan lays out six pillars. And six, uh, in those six pillars, we look at the outcomes and the things that we need to do in order to strengthen and transform our healthcare system. So the way we've always done things is not really the way we can continue to move forward. We need to transform the healthcare system. But at the same time, we know that there's incredible amount of pressure on the system at the same time. So for the fa past 15 months, we've had a bias towards action. We have been working hard. We're doing these tours because one, we want to tell folks what we're doing, what the, cha what the changes are that we're making, where some of our, you know, where the rough spots are, where it's taking us a little bit longer and the things that are going to take us a bit of time. But we want to reaffirm our commitment that we are committed to improving the healthcare system in this province. And so, and we want to answer your questions. I know there's a lot of questions. And often, what we have to tell you and your questions that you have for us really get us to a great place of understanding what's happening. Um, Karen Oldfield generally uh, is, is with us, and Bethany's uh, filling her shoes tonight, and we're grateful to have her here. And Dr. Aaron Smith is here as well to give us a hand. But I just wonder if, before we start, if we could see all the frontline healthcare workers in the room tonight. I think it's really important that we see who's here as a frontline healthcare worker. If you'd raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I really do want to acknowledge the healthcare workers in the room. It's been tough, and it's been tough before the pandemic. And the pandemic has had its own challenges for a lot of reasons. And so, um, you know, we talk about how in the early days of the pandemic, people were banging pots and clapping and really, um, you know, sending food and supporting our healthcare workers. And as the pandemic has gone on, our healthcare workers have stayed with us and have continued to work. But there has been some change in terms of how our healthcare workers are treated. And we know that there is a lot of incivility and there is a lot of, um, you know, they have it tough and, and uh, it's hard for patients and it's hard for healthcare workers and I want to thank all of you and I want to acknowledge that and I ask all of us who are consumers of the system uh, to be gentle and patient with our healthcare workers as they continue to help and care for us through this difficult time. So um, again, just thank all of you. So what we're going to do now is ask, invite the leadership team. What we'll do is tell you a little bit about what's going on first. It'll help maybe inform your questions. Um, we, this really is a dialogue. Once we get going, um, this really is a dialogue. It's a discussion. And so that's where we'll start. We're going to ask and invite the leadership team up to talk specifically, tell about their roles, tell them what's happening here for you uh, in terms of the healthcare changes and, and systems, and then we'll have an opportunity to answer your questions and, and discuss some more. So Bethany, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe, Aaron, do you want to come up now as well? Yeah. Yeah, so Jack will come right there. Yeah, so I, yeah, I can stand, yeah. So uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Bethany McCormick, and I'm the Vice President of Operations in the Northern Zone. So that includes, of course, Pictou County, Colchester East Hands, as well as Cumberland County. I've been in the role co-leading with uh, Dr. Smith for about two years. I'm really pleased to be here this evening. I wanted to maybe uh, just start this evening by thanking some key partners that we have in the services we deliver, the innovations we achieve in our zone, and particularly in this community, our Aberdeen Hospital Foundation, the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital Foundation, as well as our auxiliaries, as well as the community groups that really support us, such as Healthy Pictou County and many others. These groups make it possible for us to achieve new, exciting, innovative things in our area, and we have a couple that I wanted to highlight for you, uh, just as some examples of the good work that the teams are doing. So first of all, I just wanted to, to take some time to talk a little bit about what's happening in the hospital uh, here at the Aberdeen and at Sutherland Harris that are some of our good news items. 
So you'll hear uh, often about ambulance offloads and the efforts that we're doing around ensuring that we can move people off ambulance into the emergency department as soon as possible. I'm really pleased to say that the Aberdeen Hospital has the best uh, performance on that task, that important component of patient care in the province. So the team here is the best at ambulance offload in the province. So we are very grateful to the team for doing that and as well as the partnership with EHS that makes that possible. Um, the team has also been out sharing their successes with other sites and teams across the province so that we can learn and spread that, including in Colchester, Amherst, as well as uh, outside of our own zone. We also have, of course, the orthopedic uh, services here in the Aberdeen, and we've just recently uh, relocated the orthopedic clinic to the main floor of the hospital into a new space that the foundation so graciously supported us to, to uh, have ready for the patients and the teams. This has moved the service onto the main floor, which increases access for the patients without up and down in the elevator, same level as the diagnostic imaging service, and also makes space for us to increase the number of beds in the hospital that we have for inpatient care. So we are in the process of increasing 10 beds in the site, which will allow us to have medical care uh, in a dedicated area and allows us to have more dedicated surgical beds to make sure that we can keep surgeries flowing through the hospital. We also uh, have a plan in the works to increase ambulatory care seven days a week, and that will start in March of next year, which means for the clinics that are running right down Monday to Friday, we'll have increased options for appointments uh, for patients and their families. The other uh, item I wanted to just highlight as well is that we, we're trialing right now, early days, uh, an opportunity to move some of the lower acuity clients through the emergency department in a different pathway, so it's called a fast track. So when you come into the hospital, sometimes you have very acute care needs and you have lower acuity needs. So we're in the process, early days, of evaluating that, learning from that, seeing how we can make that more efficient. We're hoping it'll improve the patient experience and reduce the wait time. We are also in the process of, it's good when you have several pages of success, um, of really looking at all of our teams and ensuring that we have the right providers wrapped around the patient care. So for example, we've, had, we've increased our respiratory therapy coverage to 24-7. We've also added support aids, LPNs, uh, and others to our medical and surgical units to spread the load across the, uh, the team so that not only our nurses are, are there with the patients, but that we're spreading the work around to optimize the scope of practice. So at Sutherland Harris, just to highlight a few in that area as well, um, so you'll know that in that hospital we have the restorative care unit as well as the veterans unit. And with the decrease in needs from the veterans, we've had the opportunity to increase our availability of long-term care beds. So that site now has a long-term care unit combined with our veterans unit. And we were previously using the beds for other patient types, but now that we have it designated for long-term care, this has really allowed us to create a philosophy of long-term care, focus on resident well-being, health, and really making it a home for them. It's been a very positive experience. With that, we've also had uh, updates to the new recreation program there, as well as different roles being introduced to the team, some increase in support aid roles, as well as social work. We're also working on implementing an expansion to blood collection in that site. And we had the uh, installation of heat pumps in the long-term care unit as well, which provides cooling options in long-term care, which is something that we've heard from our residents is very important. So maybe I'll pass it over to Dr. Smith for a few highlights in another area. Sure, so um, for those of you who didn't hear before, um, I'm Aaron Smith, I'm the Medical Executive Director for The Zone. Um, I've uh, been in this position for the past couple of years. Uh, I know most of you probably from a previous iteration of, of my professional life. I, before doing this job, I was a primary care provider in Westville and at the Aberdeen for about 14 and a half years, and I still live with my family in Little Harbor. So for those of you who haven't met yet, um, hopefully I can make some more connections tonight. Um, I want to give you an update on some of the work we're doing in primary care. Um, as many of you know, it's not news to any of you that we remain challenged in providing access to primary care in this area specifically, provincially, but in this area specifically. Um, we know that in Pictou County we have um, you know, north of 10,000 people who are on the Need of Family Practice Registry. Um, and um, we have ongoing primary care vacancies. And 
I'm, I want to speak to that further, but before I speak to that, I also want to provide another narrative of some of the success and the innovation that we're pushing right here in this, in this zone. Um, on the physician recruitment end, which is a very hot topic, um, I'm very happy to say that in the past year, we have recruited seven physicians to Pictou County. Um, and, and, um, and we have a lot more work to do, but it, it's, it's wonderful news to start with. Um, we've, we've recruited three of those through what's called practice ready assessment, where we've taken um, physicians with medical credentials in other areas of the world and brought them here and supported them to success uh, for their own medical practice in Canada. Um, we've recruited three physicians, uh, sorry, two physicians internationally, and we've recruited uh, two Canadian trained physicians here. Um, it's been incredible success, and I expect that success to continue. And part of the recipe for that success really has been twofold. Uh, one is, is making and maintaining meaningful connections uh, with community groups, such as Healthy Pictou County. Uh, and many of you may know that um, there is a position here in the community, a, a healthcare navigator, uh, and, and Katie is here. Um, and, and that position is supported by both Healthy Pictou County and the medical staff at the Aberdeen. Uh, and and um, Katie and the, and, the, and the Healthy Big County works in close concert with our own recruitment resources in Nova Scotia Health to, to really improve um, how we connect with potential recruits and how we settle them and their families in this community. So it's an incredible resource to have. Um, the other um, part of that recipe for success, and, and, and this is why I, I'm very hopeful about the future, is we've also added specific resources to our physician recruitment across the province and, and right here in Northern Zone. Uh, so we've added physician recruitment leads, uh, who are physicians who are giving dedicated time to support our recruitment efforts. Uh, we're lucky to have three of them in Northern Zone and one of them uh, in this community specifically, and it's a name that's familiar to a lot of, of you, uh, Dr. Brad McDougall, who was my old practice partner in Westville. So we're very happy to have them helping our recruitment efforts. Um, so some of the other things we're doing is we're really trying to enhance and support team-based care uh, in this zone. So um, really helping teams support the idea of, of really a health home. So if you're part of a practice and the staff comes and goes out of that practice, we're still supporting those practices uh, in providing ongoing care for people who are part of the practice. Um, we also um, have, as I said, we have relatively high numbers on the Need of Family Practice Registry. However, I'm happy to say that we, we are holding the line on those numbers. Um, and a lot of the, that numbers, it's good news for Nova Scotia, a lot of those numbers are actually from people moving here because they want to be in Nova Scotia. Um, but we continue to, to try to um, meet those needs. Um, one, of the, um, one of the great things actually in this province that actually started right here, at least in part, was Virtual Care Nova Scotia. So it's a, a program where people Every Nova Scotian uh, has access to virtual primary care if they don't have a primary care provider. Um, it's innovative, it's great, it needs, the res it needs resources to, to help meet that need, but it's, it's a wonderful start and I'm really excited to see where that goes. And the pilot for that program was actually, was actually right here in, in Northern Zone, which I'm, I'm happy to say. Some of the other work we've done is we've placed uh, nurse practitioners in our local long-term care uh, facilities to help provide quality access to care for residents of long-term care facilities right here in Pictou County. Um, one of our um, collaborative uh, family practice clinics right here is also per, uh, in participating in a uh, program called Enhanced Access Quality Initiative, where we're working with the providers to both increase their satisfaction and also increase their capacity for, for providing primary care to people in this community. We're also supporting programs such as Inspired, uh, which really helps provide um, holistic and broad and effective care for people who are affected by COPD uh, in a, on a community basis. Another exciting program that we're at, at is just starting um, is um, really designed um, to help bring specialty level care closer to home. So in this case, we're looking at folks with inflammatory bowel disease. We're um, working with the gastroenterology department in Halifax to connect using a nurse navigator um, patients uh, right here in this community to the care they need for inflammatory bowel disease and hopefully reducing the time to be seen by a specialist and also reducing the need for travel to get the care that they need. Um, we're also supporting uh, and, ex and exploring and hopefully expanding uh, RN prescribing, especially in primary care. Um, 
we're working close with many community organizations to explore and support different models of community-based care and community-based wellness. And um, it, this is also going to be a test site for enhancements to folks' electronic medical records uh, and exploring ways to book online and also for asynchronous care. And what asynchronous care is means you're not necessarily sitting in front having a real-time conversation with your provider, but there's information flowing back and forth that allows you to get the care that you need. And finally, um, one of the other great pieces of innovation that actually started right, right here in this community was our Pharmacy Plus program. And that's really partnering with, um, with industry, with pharmacy industry, to, to have uh, full scope um, prescribing pharmacists working in close cooperation with NSH providers, such as nurse practitioners, to enhance folks' access to, to primary care. Um, so, um, as I said, um, we, we still need to do a lot of work and we're working hard at um, physician recruiting. We also have vacancies uh, in our primary care clinic, which is our local clinic for folks without a primary care provider. We have ongoing vacancies there, I think, for three NPs, but we're working hard to recruit into that as well. So, I'm happy, um, you know, through the night to speak further to any of these, or you can catch me floating around afterwards. Um, but there's, there's challenges, um, but there's lots of good news and developments in primary care locally. Thanks. So back over to me. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing in the mental health and addictions area. So um, I'm not only the Northern Zone Vice President, but I have the pleasure of leading the mental health and addictions program provincially as well. And so um, this team is also one working locally, but also provincially. So just to speak a little bit about the work in the Northern Zone. Um, we are currently continue to be very focused on recruitment and retention for the staff in the mental health and addictions program and there have been ongoing vacancies for both staff and psychiatry but i'm pleased to say in 2022-23 uh, we will have three new psychiatrists joining in the area one has started and two will be starting in the coming months um, there's also a national campaign where we're focusing in on clinical therapist recruitment specific to Pictou County and how we can support recruitment to this area using really the, the key points around the community to try and uh, entice folks to come and to stay. Um, we know that having stable, comprehensive, multidisciplinary teams are key for both inpatient uh, care in our Truro site that serves this area, but also in our outpatient services for adults, child and youth. We've been working um, closely with our policing partners as well, uh, providing uh, crisis training with police around how to respond to mental health and addictions calls in the community. This is a pilot that allows increased information sharing, training around how to respond in a, a trauma-informed way and it increases the communications across the teams. The Recovery Support Centre uh, opened at the Aberdeen Hospital for Addictions Medicine Care in February of 2022 and we continue to work on growing in, uh, those services. One of the great things uh, about this is that it allows us to do consultations into the emergency department for folks that have addictions related concerns and we're currently working to expand the recovery support into Biola's Place, a local homeless shelter that will provide uh, group options there starting in January of 2023. We also um, will be working to onboard part-time mental health nurses that will focus in on geriatrics, so the aging population uh, for both Cumberland and Pictou counties. And our uh, outreach services are being piloted here as well to look at school-aged children and autism. I also just wanted to highlight an exciting partnership that we're entering into with the Aberdeen Health Foundation to bring a, a new program called Forbo which is a study with Dalhousie Medical Research Team that aims to provide prevention, prevention services to wrap around really children and youth that aims at preventing and supporting folks that have, may have a predisposition to mental illness. So through the Aberdeen Foundation, Nova Scotia Health and with Dalhousie, we're bringing this service to the county and right now it's only offered provincially in Halifax. So it's an exciting uh, new opportunity for us. Uh, as I said off the top, we know that vacancies in our teams and the inability uh, to offer services at full scope can be really challenging for the community. We do monitor our wait times on a regular basis and we do shift teams around to try and meet the demand as we can. We also have what's called a virtual care team, so that virtual team can offer appointments for those folks that choose it 
and it's appropriate clinically to do a virtual appointment for mental health and addictions counseling or support. And that team can reach into this county or any county in the province when we need to tackle wait times or support a family or a team or a patient that needs that help. So I'll maybe stop there. And I think we just have a couple more quick highlights uh, that you, Aaron was going to cover. Yeah, so I want to give a highlight um, about some of the activities going on in public health. Um, but before I do that, I just want to pause for a minute and, and give a shout out to the public health team that, that's here um, towards the back of the room. Um, and um, hopefully you can raise, raise your hands if you're on the public health team. Everyone's looking at you now. Yeah. Um, and I also want to take a moment to introduce Dr. Kristen Muick, uh, who is also hiding in the back, and she is our medical officer of health for the area here. Um, when, you know, at first we said this has been an unbelievably trying time for frontline healthcare providers, I can attest to that. I still provide uh, a small amount of, of frontline care. Uh, it has been an unbelievably challenging time for our public health teams across the province. Um, and I just want to take a moment to recognize you know, the, the leadership and the support that, that that team has continued to provide for this province and locally. Um, it absolutely deserves recognition. Um, so the relatively good news is that, uh, you know, COVID is still with us. It's still um, causing, um, causing lots of illness uh, right around the province, but we've entered a phase uh, that is certainly much more stable in terms of our need to respond. And, and that has meant that the public health team has been able to be brought back from focusing um, as needed on our, on our acute COVID response, and we're able, they're able to get back into some of the work that, that really is making a difference in the communities. Uh, so for example, um, Public health is back into the early years um, universal screening program in hospital and community, which is extremely important. Uh, they're also working hard with um, our schools and, and CCRE to, to ensure that our, our youth uh, are getting appropriate access um, for health promotion, health eating, youth health centers, uh, and also working closely with CCRE to, um, to have a school reporting for illness, which allows us to monitor and respond as needed. Um, also, uh, one, of the, one of the pieces that came out of a previous community meeting like this was public health has mobile um, public health outreach units that go into communities, especially high risk um, or isolated communities, to provide health care and health services. Um, and it was suggested at a previous meeting in the province that they should also be offering flu vaccine clinics. Uh, and that's been incorporated since that meeting, and now the public health mobile teams are offering flu, flu clinics um, around, the, around the province. Um, and in, in this area, they're, they're connecting with uh, patient populations which are relatively higher risk, such as temporary foreign workers, Pictou Landing First Nations, um, the Pictou Shelter, and working with African Nova Scotian communities to ensure that we have appropriate um, public health outreach units within those communities. So, yeah, they've shifted their focus um, from, from a COVID response to really getting back into work that's improving health in our communities. So, happy to report all those activities are, are back on. Thanks. I think that's where we wanted to kind of stop for now, and I'll pass it over to anyone else on the panel or to Nancy for some the next remarks. Okay. Thanks, Bethany. I think I'll pass it over to uh, Deputy Minister Lagasse for some comments. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Bethany and Aaron. That was fantastic. Um, I, I work with these folks all the time, and I can tell you they are working tirelessly on, on behalf of, of your zone and, and all of you. So uh, you're very lucky to have them, I can, I can tell you that for sure. Um, there's just a few other people that I would like to acknowledge who are here tonight. Uh, one of them is Dr. Nicole Bootlier. She's the Vice President of Medicine at Nova Scotia Health, and I'm sure well known to many of you here in the community. Another tireless worker on your behalf, I can tell you she's... Uh, She's amazing to work with. And again, you're very lucky to have her in your community. And then Kevin McMullen is here with, uh, he's a representative of the paramedics union. And I, I draw Kevin to your attention because I'm gonna chat a bit about uh, emergency health services now. And uh, what we're doing in that area um, to uh, hopefully improve things uh, within your zone. So emergency health services is run, the ambulance uh, service is run by a private company, EMCI. And the Department of Health and Wellness is really the regulator of that service. So here with us tonight also is uh, Jeff Fraser. He's our executive director in uh, emergency health services. And he works really closely with the provider, with the paramedics union and others uh, to try to uh, ensure 
that the units are where you need them, when you need them, and are responsible and reliable for you. And we know that that has not always been the case. We know that there have been some real challenges in response times. Uh, so a number of things have gone on over the last year, 18 months, to try to improve that. So we know that on any given day, that there can be upwards of 70% of the calls that EHS receive that don't actually need, the people don't actually need emergency care or transport to an emergency department, but they do need care. There is something that they do need and that's why they've made that call. So we've implemented a few things to help out in that regard. Uh, one of them is we've started a new patient transfer model where before uh, upwards of 80% of transfers would have been done uh, by an ambulance to paramedics. And we've moved now to a transport operator model and a paramedic. And so that means that there's more paramedics who are able to be on the trucks for those emergency calls when we do need them. And we've gone from about that 80% of transfers down to in the 20% range, and we're hoping to get down to 5%. So just really freeing up the trucks and the paramedics to be on those emergency calls when we need them. We've also implemented in the uh, communication center when the calls come in uh, to uh, EHS that there is now 24 seven a physician actually in the communication center. So that when, and just last week, the two weeks ago, a uh, nurse uh, is also in the uh, facility there. So that when calls come in and the call is triaged, they are able to communicate with the person who's made the call and say, we don't think that you need emergency transport, but you need something. And so they help to work them through that and then stay in contact with the person until either the paramedics do arrive. We've also instituted a single paramedic uh, response in some areas of the province, hoping to expand. And that allows, so again, someone might need more primary care attention. And so just a single paramedic can head out. They have kind of an SUV that's outfitted with everything that they need. And they can provide care for that person right at their, right at their home and no transport needs to be made. If they get there and they see that a transport needs to be made, then that is done as well. So there's just a, we're just implementing as many things as we can to try to prevent the transfers being made to emergency departments where we know we have real challenges with capacity right now. So implementing the uh, physician in the communication center and the single paramedic response unit, we've reduced about 3,200 transports a month into the emergency department. So we're seeing considerable success with it in early days and we're, we're really looking forward to continuing and expanding those options so that people are getting the care that they need when they need it, but without having to be uh, at a higher level of care where, where we have uh, other people who are waiting, waiting for it. Uh, we've also instituted, um, we know as the minister spoke to about our uh, frontline healthcare workers, paramedics, absolutely in that group as well, right? And their working conditions are very tough as well. They have a lot of uh, vacancies currently. So working really hard at that area as well to recruit, but also looking at working conditions and what are things that we can do for the paramedics to, to make their working conditions better. So things related to ensuring that their shift ends on time, that they're able to get their breaks and, and other supports for them so that they have a work environment that is, is, is healthier for them and, and they're, they're getting the job satisfaction that we hope that they are. One, la one last thing that I'd like to uh, raise before I ask Jeff to come up to say a few things is that we've also worked with the college over this last year, the college that licenses the paramedics and have worked with them to allow for the paramedics once they finish their formal education to really st to start work before they are fully licensed and have a, a work period where they've moved in. So it allows us to get those people out onto the trucks faster and helping to, uh, to bring people into the workforce. And so I just would like Jeff to, to chat a bit about, um, Bethany had, had raised about uh, the fantastic offload times that you have here at the Aberdeen and just what that means um, for the system and our ability for, uh, for those, uh, and a bit of context around how, what a fantastic statistic that is and the work that's been done here. Yeah, so I'm not sure if anybody here is from the Aberdeen Emergency Department, but if you are, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, all right makes a big difference. So all the things that the deputy talked about, it's about increasing capacity. 
And when that happens and you're able to take our patients, we're able to get back in those communities. So we are so grateful and you by all accounts are leading the pack. So thank you very much, appreciate it. All right. Okay, so now we get to go to the question and answer portion of the event. So um, some of you, when you came in, there were cards on the table. So it, hanging off my ear. Um, if you have a question that you would like me to read, you can just put your hand up and we can come get the card. If you have a question you would like to read yourself, we have two mic runners that will come to you so you don't have to get up. They will come to you and, um, and you can ask your question. I would ask, we've been doing this for a bit and so we're learning as we go about uh, the process. And so it's two things I always say. So one, I do have to point, and I know it's that rude pointing thing, you're not supposed to point. It's the only way I can figure out how to acknowledge that I see you and, and that you're going to be called upon. So if you have a question you'd like to be, um, that you'd like to ask, you can put your hand up, I'll point to you, and we'll try to be as equitable as possible across the room. I would ask if the question has already been addressed or asked that you, um, maybe save that until we go through other uh, potential topics so that we can cover as many things as possible. It is, uh, it's been pretty impressive to watch the breadth of questions that have come through these conversations. So the more uh, different topics we get, the more information we get. So I would encourage you if, uh, if you have something that you wanna ask um, to, uh, to put your hand up and do that. Also, if we run out of time, and it's wonderful, it's really encouraging to see how many people are here tonight. And that also means that we might run out of time. So if you have lots of questions and we run out of time, I will say back to these cards again, if you could please write your question on your card with your contact information and someone will get in touch with you and answer your question. And so I say that up front before we have to sometimes give our apologies at the end and say, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone. So I think to kick it off, I'm actually going to ask a question. So it kind of warms everybody up and gets a sense of the tone of, of what, we're, uh, what we're looking at. And some of these questions can be tough, and that's OK. Uh, the team is used to answering them. So the first question, and this, oops, anyway. Patients with primary care providers are not able to ask, access the care they need when they need it. Virtual care has not been an option for most untouched patients in Pictou County due to capacity already when patients log in. Patients are still going to the emergency rooms for prescription renewals. Patients being discharged from hospital without a primary care provider are at increased risk for premature readmission. Access to care needs to be equitable, equitable across the province. With the percentage of patients without a primary care provider in our county sitting at the highest number in Nova Scotia, what specific actions have you taken to lessen this number? So I'm going to start. <laughs> It takes a team for sure to answer a big question like that. So there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, so recruit our, our workforce is probably the biggest challenge that we're facing in this province. And, and I don't think we're unlike other provinces in terms of that challenge and actually globally. And some of that's because of the way we train people and you know what have you. I will say we've known for about 15 years at least that we were going to experience healthcare worker shortages. And unfortunately, the things that were implemented um, were not implemented quickly enough, perhaps, and so here we are. So we are recruiting. We have an Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment uh, that, that is solely focused on increasing the number of healthcare professionals that we're working with. We know we need to grow our own workforce. And I say all the time, if you have youth in your life, there is jobs for every young person in this province, in every corner, in every community in this province. And we want to avoid folks leaving. We certainly have opportunities here if they feel that healthcare is part of it. So we do have good incentive programs for physicians to come and work. So there would be a sign-on bonus. And then at the end of uh, each year for, for five years, they would also get um, a bonus. So it's $125,000 in total in rural Nova Scotia, so you get an initial sign-on bonus and then $20,000 at the end of every year. 
we continue to work really hard on immigration. So we have uh, physicians who were born and raised um, and nurse practitioners and other healthcare providers who were bo internationally educated and born in a different country than ours. And so we're looking at how do we recruit them and bring them here and streamline the process. But we also have a number of Nova Scotians who actually, uh, for whatever reason, whether they can't get in here or you know want a, want a different experience, they, they train internationally. So sometimes they train in Sabo or Ireland or Australia, like we have a lot of them. And what's really important when you train internationally is that you have a residency when you come back, if you've ever heard of that. So we've actually just recently identified and, and dog-eared 10 um, residency seats for Nova Scotians who are internationally educated to come back and work in our home province, because it's been really difficult for them to do that, and I'm sure some of you maybe know some of these graduates. So that's some of the work we're doing around recruitment. Um, the other thing is around the virtual care, one of the things that we know is there's a difference between being attached and having access. They're not the same thing. So there's some people who are attached, but unfortunately, um, some of the um, primary care providers in the offices are really quite overwhelmed. And so recently we did a pilot, we're in the middle of a pilot with Dow Family Medicine. And so Dow Family Medicine felt that they were kind of maxed out, that they had reached the, the kind of the crucible of, of who and how many people they could take. So Nova Scotia Health assembled a team and they, they got, um, uh, industrial engineers and some administrative folks and they went in over a weekend and they looked at the processes and they looked at the care providers and through that investigation and optimization team they actually identified with Dow Family Medicine that they could probably take up to 3,500 new patients as a result of that practice optimization. So that team now exists and is available to primary care providers across the province if they choose to, to engage. And we can go in, that team can go in and have a look at their, at their practices and help them identify ways in which we can um, you know, support their practice to becoming uh, efficient in a different way. Because when you've been doing something for a really long time, you know, we've all changed a bit. Like the way that you start practicing 25 years ago, and you can tell 15 years ago, it's not the same work environment that, that physicians and nurse practitioners are experiencing today. So those are some of the things that are underway. We know that there's a number of folks that you folks are the first people to have the nurse practitioner and the pharmacist model, which has been really effective. And to the point about the mobile units, we've been sending mobile units around uh, to different communities. There are three of them. And those have been able um, to see up to, you know, about 100, 150 patients uh, at a time over a weekend in order for people to access primary care. So what we're trying to do is improve, improve access through virtual care and through primary care clinics, and at the same time transform the way we do things. So I'm sure there's other things that folks want to add, but those are some of the initiatives that we've undertaken at a provincial level. Thank you, Minister. What I would just add around the virtual care Nova Scotia platform, uh, in the question it was mentioned about signing in for an appointment and you can't uh, get one on that given day. So that platform also requires that we have physicians or nurse practitioners at this time as the available provider on that platform. Um, and so when we when we think about providing that care in their virtual environment, one of the one of the guiding principles that we're trying to follow in Nova Scotia is that we're hoping that we're not moving people away from an in-person practice into the virtual platform. So we're trying not to like rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. So when we're approaching folks to work on the virtual platform, our goal is really to see if they want to pick up an extra time period, if they would like to add that to their practice repertoire, or perhaps they're retired and they, and they want to offer this virtual option. So what that means is we're trying to be mindful of the providers on the virtual platform and not pulling them away from in-person care. And so that can mean on some days the virtual platform gets maxed out, just like a walk-in clinic gets maxed out and the eMERGE gets full and those kinds of things. So we know that can be frustrating and we're working on improving that. We're also working on looking at other provider types that can be on the platform to support different types of healthcare needs. So I was going to pass it over to Aaron. Yeah, just just a few more comments on some of the uh, on some of the specifics, and and I will apologize. I just got a text from our communications person saying before I wasn't holding the mic close enough to my mouth, and people probably couldn't hear me. Um, so uh, I, I apologize, and I'll try to hold it up uh, more. Um, so just speaking to a couple specific points here, um, as I said, um, we've had some great recruitment success for physicians in this county, and with uh, you know ongoing partnerships with um, with Healthy Pictou County. 
as well as the addition of our physician recruitment leads, I'm very hopeful uh, that that pattern will, will only get better. Um, the other two, two specific items here, the, the practice enhancement um, program uh, that, that was mentioned, uh, one of our collaborative um, family practice groups here in this county is engaging in that program. We hope to see some great success out of that. Uh, the final piece I wanted to talk to um, is another very important and, and very good news story uh, is that of our uh, family medicine resident training program right here in Northern Zone. It's called the North Nova Family Medicine Resident Training Program. Uh, and through that program in partnership with Dow, we provide family medicine residency training positions uh, it was uh, six, six positions a year, and we're looking at possibly um, um, uh, expanding that. We have family medicine residents doing learning placements all over the zone uh, in New Glasgow, in, um, in Tatamagush, in Truro, in Amherst, and we're looking to expand that all the time. We've had recruitment success with that program, uh, and we hope to continue to have success. Our, our physician group uh, throughout the zone and, and other healthcare providers have been amazingly supportive. Uh, and it means that we're, we're training family medicine residents uh, literally right in this town and, and um, get them used to rural practice. And hopefully we can have continued recruitment and retention success through that program. So thank you. So I'm going to have one more because I have one that was handed in on a card that was asked for me to read. So the question is about um, dialysis patients. So why doesn't government cover the cost for transportation for Chad bus for dialysis patients to and from Antigonish or other areas? And the second question is, why is there no dialysis unit in the Aberdeen when there are patients that have to travel to Antigonish to get it? Um, so certainly access to dialysis care as close to home as possible is a very big priority for the northern zone. We, uh, the zonal program as well as the renal dialysis program provincially have been working together to look at all options to maximize access, including the ability to expand the number of renal dialysis uh, stations in the county. Um, and we have a number of proposals put in right now with government that are looking at expanding that in the very near term. And we're very hopeful around uh, the ability to move ahead with that. We know that when people can't receive care close to home, uh, they are traveling either by uh, the CHAD bus, as was mentioned, or by paramedic uh, EHS, and that is not an ideal patient experience. People often have to go three days a week, you know, an hour each direction minimum, and, and we don't want that. So we are really committed to solving that problem together, and we know the need in this county is high. Um, and so, the, uh, right now we have the Sutherland Harris Hospital has the dialysis unit, very dedicated team and staff over there who are seeing as many patients as they can to keep up with the demand. But when we do need to uh, offer services, we either book the patient into Anaganish or to Tro, and unfortunately sometimes as far away as Halifax. So we do uh, constantly review the folks that are on the wait list and move folks back closer to home as quickly as we can to make sure that they uh, can have care without having to be on uh, ambulance for a long period of time. We do know too that if you need inpatient uh, care and renal dialysis at the same time, it is ideal for that to be in the same uh, building. So long term, we know that we, we are striving to have some dialysis beds co-located with acute care services in this zone. We're working on that as well. As I said, we have a number of plans in the works. We did just have the opportunity to do just that in Cumberland County, where we had only a we had a community-based uh, renal program in Spring Hill, and now we also have a community or a sorry a dialysis unit in the regional hospital in Amherst. So we have another example in the zone where we've succeeded with that, and I'm really uh, hopeful that we'll be able to uh, implement that here as well. Okay, thanks. So. I always, and I always stay, and I have to stand for this too, otherwise I can't see. So, um, okay. See, here's my pointing. So, I'm not sure who our mic runners are. Do we? Oh, we don't have any. Can we have some mic runners? We're very, very organized. I'm sorry. Okay, Dr. Smith's going to be a mic runner. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dominic Boyd. I'm with the, uh, a committee that's uh, seeking to create a community health center here in Pictou County. 
And so my question about that is, is there room in your strategic plan for creating community health centers, uh, hopefully throughout the province, because I'm a great believer in that, uh, that model. My other question is, our current amalgamated healthcare system, is it actually working any better than the old system, which had, I think, about eight different uh, health authorities? Do you have any kind of information on, on uh, how the two are, uh, are working? Which was better, our current system or the former one? Thank you. I can start with uh, the part about the um, community health center. That we've, over the last year, we've done uh, quite a bit of work with the existing community health centers. And we know that there are a number of communities that, it would, that would like to establish one. Um, the group that, there's an organized group that some of the community health centers belong to. I think there's six or so of them that belong to it. And they're engaged currently in our primary care transformation work that they have been there being engaged in that. Because in Action for Health, Solution 6 is all about community wellness. So it's about prevention, it's about health promotion, and the creation of a community wellness framework. And we know that the community health centers will be a key part in that work. So absolutely engaged. I've met with I think all of them now, the existing ones over the last year. We were in, we've been at a few of them, uh, the minister and I, and then I've been down in Chester and at the North End Centre in, in Halifax. And they're all very different as well, I think is the other thing, right, that we need to appreciate is that we've had really good discussion with the community health centres about it isn't, it isn't just a model. It's about really looking at what's needed in the community, what the community can offer, and then making sure that we're working around that. So the work through Solution 6 and Action for Health and the Community Wellness Framework is where those organisations will fit. Now the second part. <laughs> so, so this is what I'm going to say. Um, I'm, so I, th I'm just going to tell you what I think. And I hope it's okay with everybody. <laughs> I, think, I think we are where we are now in terms of one health authority. I think for those of us that live in rural uh, Nova Scotia, we felt uh, the amalgamation of you know, becoming one uh, district health authority, perhaps in a different way. And I think, you know, for many of us, um, the local decision making was really an important part, a really important part of our autonomy as rural communities. And so I think for a while we did lose that, or it felt more difficult. So I also think that the healthcare cycle cannot, or the healthcare system cannot continue to be meddled with in terms of a political cycle. So I think we have a structure now, and I think our job is to optimize that. So one of the things that's really important is that, you know, it's great I'm here, but these are the folks that are really, um, you know, in your community. We really want to make sure that there is local decision making, that there are people on the ground who are informing our decisions, that we, you as, as citizens have access to your elected officials and, and, and you know, deputy ministers, so that we can be really clear that these are the things that we're doing, and we want to make sure that we take the temperature and that we're planning as a system now. So we now have Department of Health and we have Nova Scotia Health working together and making plans across the system that hadn't happened before. So there was a bit of a disconnect, sometimes a really big disconnect. So this is the structure we have. We do feel that we can optimize the structure we have. And in part, it comes back to the local decision making. There surely are ways that we can you know, experience economy of scales. There are things we didn't need nine of everything or eight of everything or, you know, there's, and, and there's ways, but at the same time, we need to keep the local flavor. So I do believe, um, you know, I wasn't a believer in the beginning, way back when it happened. I missed a lot of my colleagues and I missed my district health authority. You know, I, we were part of Gasha and I knew a lot of people who I knew how things worked, but that's okay. I see now, I'm very fortunate in this position to see that, you know, this, these, these individuals working hard, um, committed people to optimizing the system and to be able to transform it now. So imagine trying to transform nine district health authorities versus coming together at a table where we can move all our initiatives forward. And there's some pretty great things that are coming up, some pretty historical 
um, you know, transformation items and investments that are happening, and we're able to do that now as a province to the point that was made earlier around making sure we have equitable access so that you can expect the same care here as anyone else should expect in Western Zone or what have you. So I do believe in it. I do think we're on the right track, and I think the leadership structure is really essential, and I think really deputizing and empowering your local leaders to give us feedback and make um, decisions based in community is really another essential part. So I hope that I hope that answered it. Yeah. I would, can I just add one thing, yeah. sir? Uh, I just want to pick up on the the point that the minister made about um, transformation, because really that's what Action for Health is about. That we we know that we cannot just tinker around the edges anymore. We can't try small things here and there. We need to be big. We need to be bold. And we want to work toward a world-class health system. That is, that is the intention behind Action for Health. It's not just to get a bit better, it's to get a lot better. And we are able to do some of the things that we are doing because there is the one provincial health authority that we would not be able to test and try the way that we have in different places around the province as quickly as we have. We wouldn't be able to, we could probably, but it would be a lot more bureaucracy to move that mobile bus from Yarmouth one weekend up to Sydney the next weekend, right? Like, so it's just, it's just everything that we're doing. It's, it is that, if there's a bit of economy of scale there, but it's also about the bold action that we need to take. We need to be nimble we need, and we need to just be like moving quickly. And so to have that one health authority, I think has been a, a, a real advantage. Okay, thank you. Okay, oh look, okay, now I'm starting the pointing. So we've got one, then two, then three. Then four. Okay. Hi, my name is Shelley Moore. I'm a paramedic in this community. And I would like to discuss the offload delay. Although the Aberdeen is fantastic and we don't wait here, we wait hours in other parts of the province, uh, which pulls ambulances out of our own community. So what's happening now is Halifax, per se, Arturo, have 8, 10, 12 hour offload delay where paramedics are sitting with these patients until they're put in a room. What that causes is a provincial wide shift, which means we're moving two hours to do calls in Halifax because they can't get out to do their own calls, which means patients that are needing ambulance care in this community are not getting it or are waiting longer because we're taking two hours to drive to a call in Halifax or an hour to Truro, which shifts ambulances from Bedeck as far as Port Hawkesbury, all these places to shift and work in other areas where they're unfamiliar because offload delays are such a problem, and they have been for many years. But provincially, it's, it's getting pretty bad, where you're moving ambulances from, you know, as far as Bedeck to cover off areas, and we're responding two hours to do one ambulance call, and now there's no real priority given to your community. It's a provincial sort of triage system, so there may be a higher priority call in Truro or Halifax but there also might be a call in New Glasgow that's not going to get done because they've deemed the call in Halifax as a higher priority, but all the paramedics are sitting in the hallways there. What's being done to manage that problem? Yeah. So that's a great question, and it's, it's a big question, so just bear with me, and you probably know a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm going to say. So we work, the healthcare system is a continuum. So it's not just getting into care, but it's really important that people are able to get out of care, right? So I will tell you, the success of our home care and our long-term care sector is essential in order for us to have people move through acute care. So we have a number of people who currently are residing in hospital who are waiting for potentially home care services, but most often they are waiting for long-term care. They're not able to transition to their home because of uh, the complexity of their illness. So I told you in the beginning that I recently came from long-term care, and I'll tell you one of the really difficult things that we were challenged with was the staffing. So continuing care assistants are the backbone of our long-term care and our home care um, sector. So I'll give you an example of what we were facing. Um, in probably 2019, there were maybe eight people who graduated from the straight campus in the continuing care program. They would have had a significant opportunity for enrollment, perhaps 20 people enrolled and eight people completed the program. I could have easily taken every one of those eight folks at the facility I worked in. So we had a number of beds across the province that were closed because we could not adequately staff long-term care. 
So last year, we increased the salary for continuing care assistants um, and, and fairly substantially, which I'm very proud of. And as a result of that move, we now have 1,000 uh, people registered in the continuing care assistant program across this province um, from one end to the other, which is a huge number when you think that I think we graduated around 250 the last time we had full classes. So pretty significant increase. In addition to that, um, we also now in long-term care, the people are able to, pl to train some of their own, own folks. So if you wanted to be a CCA and you had a mortgage and you had kids and you had a car and you had all of the different practicalities of life, it's really hard for you to step away from your life and go back to school. So there's no fees now. The, the tuition is free for continuing care assistance and we do support them um, with uh, some program materials as well. But long-term care facilities can actually take um, people and do some in-house training and it's called prior learning, um, uh, recognition of prior learning. And so they can enroll in that and as they work, actually study modules. So I know that it seems like it's really far away from the paramedics, but that is such an important part. Like that will free um, up a significant number of beds. We also have invested uh, in what's called a command center and it's currently in, the, in Halifax. And what it is is I mean, it, it, it's pretty amazing. It tells us exactly what's going on in the system. So right now, very much a paper-based system. Phone calls, faxes, those folks working in healthcare will know. It, it's kind of a clunky, antiquated system. But we now have a C3, and this is a, co a command center that allows us to visualize, and there's folks in the room that know it better than I, that visualize what's happening in the system. Who is in the emergency room? What are the requirements for that person? who is in hospital, who's able to be discharged, what is the holdup, and it allows, and in that command center there are, there are folks who are clinicians, so it's not people that aren't clinicians making it, and making real-time decisions, and that will roll out, because to your point, when the city's busy, it pulls from, it does pull. We need to increase our workforce. We know there are a number of vacancies, so we need to be able to train more paramedics in this province, and we need to make sure that we do things to support paramedics being well at work. So we invested in power stretchers and power lifters, and I know they're not in every truck yet, but they are coming. And the equipment, like the ambulances, making sure that paramedics, when we do repurpose those, that, that paramedics have input into what they need in the back of those trucks for a better work environment to prevent injury, physical injury. So I don't know, Jeff, if there's other things you want to talk about or Janine. Like, we, we know that it's an issue. We also have a working group at Department of Health that has uh, the paramedics union, the college, uh, Department of Health, Nova Scotia Health, really digging into what can we do and where we see success, like the Aberdeen, understanding how much of that is process, how much of that is culture, and then how do we, like, test and try and, and replicate it across the province. So. We are committed to improving that system, and uh, you know we're working hard. And if you have any suggestions for us, we would love to hear them because it really is about solutions from the field. So that's my part, and I'm sure there's other folks that will add a little bit. But it's like up here, we know it's a problem. other complex behaviors or conditions. And uh, it's not just long-term care, but when we talk about this being a health system problem, it's a whole of government system problem because sometimes it's housing that these people need. It's not actually long-term care. It's housing with supports to have them in their home. But if we don't have housing for them, we can't give them the supports to live at home. So we, but as recently as today, We've set a new uh, task team on exactly this. So people from the department, people from the health authority, from Department of Health, people from the health authority, people from the Department of Community Services, our colleagues at Housing and Municipal Affairs. And we're looking at some of those patients, right, that have really complex needs and what it is we need to do to help them to be able to get to home, whatever that is for them. So it's going to take us a bit more time to get through that, but I know that they were very optimistic after today's meeting, but it all feeds in. You are exactly right on what you said. And so, but it's it's a really complex problem across the health system, but also across all of government. But I as the minister said, I we are on it to the best of our ability. 
Thanks, Minister. I'll just <coughs> I'll mention uh, as well, part of our responsibility, and, 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 and Shelley did a great job of articulating the offload issue that we do have across the province, but the best way to stay out of offload is not to get into it to begin with. And so we are looking at tooling our systems and recognizing that EHS is really an EMS, Emergency Medical Service System. Systems like that are built to be reactive. We're really trying to change ours a little bit. We uh, will, ex as we stabilize our ground system, we will expand our community paramedic piece and do more in community, more things that we can do to help keep, keep people in their homes and healthy in their community the better the systems and the better the patient outcomes will be. So when the minister and the deputy talked earlier about the nurse that we just added into the communication center, we recognize that within our system, and, and one of the numbers we threw out, you know, we use this little thing called CTAS, Canadian Triage Acuity Scale. So hospitals and paramedic services use this to classify patients on how sick they are. We recognize in our program that over 70% of the patients we see are CTAS, three, fours, and fives. Those are s relatively stable patients. And so rather than use a sledgehammer on a thumbtack, what can we really do to provide that patient um, an opportunity to get what they really need? And what we do know is taking a CTAS 4 or 5 patient to an emergency, an already overcrowded emergency department, it's not patient-centric, it's not good for the system. So we need to come up with other options. Other jurisdictions in the world, we're we're not necessarily, you know, we don't have the ability to pull this off the shelf out of a book. We have to look at what others have done. Europe has done a fantastic job of this. They are patient-centered, safe um, services. And you know what? There are people that we still need to take. And those 30%, those, the other 30% of the people do need to go to the hospital. We have to free up our capacity, and we have to look at the patients. And we're, are we giving the patients what they need? And what our plan is over the next few years is to tailor our service to really be patient-centric and make sure that we give patients what they need. I hope that helped. I was just going to add a couple more things about uh, overall system improvement. So access and flow is a priority initiative in the Action for Health uh, program. And in the uh, care journey of a patient, you have to really keep all of the elements from the very entry in the door by EHS through the emergency department, through inpatients, and to home, as the minister has discussed, moving constantly. And so the success that we've seen here at the Aberdeen and the success we're seeing in other sites is the team's constant attention, never letting their foot off the gas, on keeping the patient's journey moving. Um, so that means how are we moving people into the emergency department, and if they are now stabilized enough that they can move to a chair so the next person can come to a stretcher, how are we doing that? Who's the leader that's coaching the team through that? When they move upstairs to an inpatient bed, we have new uh, pilots running in eight units in the, in the health authority, two here in our zone, around optimizing medicine care. So this is about what are the five best practices that we need to do for patients that are in a medical unit every day to make sure that every day of their journey is optimized so there's no days kind of lost for that patient it's the best care experience for the patient it also reduces our length of stay so those are some examples we also have virtual emergency department which is a, a pilot happening now in colchester started there and it's been scaled to yarmouth and we're learning from that around the patients that may present in the emergency department they go through the triage desk and they're given the option if they meet certain criteria to see a virtual emergency physician. And this moves the patient into a different uh, kind of corridor pathway where they see a physician online who can assess their needs, can order tests, can order diagnostics. They have somebody in the department who's physically there uh, assessing the patient being the hands of the physician, so to speak. And we are seeing great success with that, offloading some of the pressures from the waiting room, also offloading some of the pressure from the main emergency department area. So all of these different strategies that we're trying, we're learning from them and then scaling them up to try and remove uh, you know, system pressure in different places. Um, and so all of these efficiencies in each part of the hospital system as well as the community system are going, will contribute to this uh, success with offload and, and having that strong commitment on reviewing the data and feeding back to our teams around how they're doing with their offload you know, what, what made today not such a successful day? What do we need to change? What was successful, you know, in the next shift that made it so much better and learning from that and feeding that back on a regular basis 
and we know we still have a lot of work to do. So I just wanted to summarize some of the other things that are underway. Okay, thanks, Bethany. Um, I think we had another question. Who's, oh, sorry, here. Hi, my name's Andrew Fraser. It's apparent that our current healthcare system is having trouble meeting the needs of the people already here in Nova Scotia. So why is the government bringing in thousands of immigrants to Nova Scotia every year? This is putting more strain on an already overburdened healthcare system. It has been said that Tim Houston wants to double our population in the years to come. To add insult to injury, MP Sean Fraser and the Liberals have cancelled a long-standing law which prohibits people who are sick and dying from coming in as immigrants. We are becoming a hospital for the world. The solution is clear. Stop the mass immigration and the ones we do allow in should be healthy and a benefit, not a burden to our society. Thank you. So we, we, we are not able to grow our own workforce and it's really important that we bring um, internationally educated folks to our communities. Um, we, have a number of, um, we have a number of physicians who have trained and, and lived across the world and this makes our community diverse, it makes us, um, you know, we have a wonderful province and, and we do need more people to come and live here. We do need more, we need a bigger tax base. We need people who are coming to live and work and enjoy. And, and part of the biggest, the, one of the biggest things that we need communities to understand is that we can bring all of the folks here that we want to work and look after our healthcare needs from these very skilled people. But if they don't feel welcome in a community, they won't stay. And so it's really important that we offer a welcoming environment when people come to live and work and look after us. They bring their families. They come, they settle in, and they integrate into our community. And it, there's a lot of strength and diversity. We know that these internationally educated folks, whether they be teachers or nurses or physicians, they add vibrancy to our community. So we will continue to grow our population and we will continue to, to uh, seek and, and recruit internationally educated uh, healthcare workers and for them to bring their families to come and work and care and, and look after us and, and uh, make our province stronger. Thank you. No, actually, we take, I guess that should have been my other, forgot. If questions have already been asked, please pause, and we're going to take one question at a time, and then if we have time at the end to go back to people, because it's, it does can get busy. So I think we had a gentleman here that was, did you still have a question? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Somebody, sorry. Yeah, no, you can go first, and then you. Sorry, my very formal. <laughs> you, then you. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Gary Milnes, uh, and... Uh, in solution one of the Action for Health states the need to understand and address systemic racism, oppression, and discrimination in recruitment and intention in retention strategies. And, and that is necessary. I agree with that. While the majority of Canadian provinces have called their unvaccinated health care workers back to work, when will you stop discriminating against the unvaccinated health care workers in Nova Scotia and call them back to work? So Nova Scotia Health uh, will not be changing the current policy on vaccinated healthcare workers. There's no plan at this time to change the policy. My name is Jeremy Valentine. Um, okay, I'll say that again. My name is Jeremy Valentine. I'm here as a concerned Canadian because I really don't like being lied to as a Canadian, okay? I was the director of operations for one of Canada's largest healthcare recruitment and physician recruitment companies. Okay, that's one. Um, I was started out either surrounded by or employed within the environmental industry since I was about three years old, okay? I worked for one of the, perhaps the largest environmental co company if in, in North America, if not the world, okay? Um, when these face mask mandates came in, I knew some, immediately I knew something was wrong. It is impossible for your, that, that face mask you're wearing to stop a virus, impossible. Those are meant for doctors like him here, 
from coughing into an open wound. That's what they're there for. They're, those go down to 100 microns a hair, okay? A virus is 0 0.08, thousands of times smaller. It will go right through your skin. And if nobody, if people here doubt me, this is theater, this is politics, and this is psychology. This is not science. You don't, you, if you doubt me, when you get home, everybody here, go to Google, type in Wuhan Virus Lab, all of those labs are the same at that level, okay? And you'll see they're wearing enclosed filtration systems. Fully covered, they're wearing full Tyvek suits, uh, gloves, boots, because that's how small a virus is. It'll go right through your skin. So I would, my question is about accountability. Is it possible, or who will hold the criminals, in my opinion, that have pushed this lie onto Canadians? I mean, these are facts, and these are facts you can look up very easy, okay? I'd like to know who, how can we hold criminals like, say, Tim Houston? or Dr. Strang. In my opinion, this should never have been done. The science has been denied to the population of Canada. Thank you. So I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna argue with you about that today. Certainly, um, you know, the pandemic was unprecedented and uh, you know, we've moved through that place in, in the best way that we knew how to do that. And so we continue to respond to COVID-19. We do the best we can with the science that we have. We follow public health uh, guidelines. And, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not in a position to argue with your, with your science, but you know, certainly we continue to figure this out together. And what's important is that people have choice now. They can make the decisions that are, are best for them and we'll continue to move forward in that fashion. Thank you. Oh, question back here. Uh, first of all, Thank you to all of you. You're really focusing on something that's important to all of us and that you are putting this effort into trying to improve and change our system. Like, I thank you personally. It's really important work you're doing. There's been a lot of talk about recruitment. I'm wondering about the retention. That seems to be a problem sort of throughout Nova Scotia. I know it is everywhere, but mm -hmm. is there anything that, that you're actively trying to do to help with that issue? Thank you for the... Thank you for the question. Um, retention is something that we, we are giving a lot of attention to at Nova Scotia Health, and I'll give you, you know, a few examples of some of the areas that we're focusing in on. So. We, um, in the organization uh, previously, and in many healthcare organizations, they would do what's called an exit interview. So someone leaves the organization, you find out, you know, why didn't you stay? We are actually doing what we call stay interviews. What, what, is, what is it that you need to he have here at work to make your job satisfaction higher? What would improve your patient care uh, delivery? What makes your team stronger? Or if someone comes to any manager in our organization and brings up an idea, or an opportunity for improvement? How do we explore that together? How do we try to say yes to the opportunities that our teams are bringing to us as ways to improve? Um, we also have increased flexibility now around uh, you know, how we structure a position for an individual. So you know, sometimes we have someone who's maybe working what we consider like an 80% uh, job, and they really need to have a, you know, a full-time position in order for it to be suitable for them and their family. So we make a great effort to have that conversation with the employee and understand what their needs are and what flexibility we might have to address that. Similarly, sometimes we have folks that as their life circumstances change, maybe they were full-time but they need to reduce. You know, maybe they now have young children or maybe they need to spend more time with their family, whatever the reason might be. How can we adjust their schedule to uh, make it more reasonable for them to stay at work? The other thing that we know is getting the planned time off, requested time off that healthcare workers want and need is really important. So we are trying uh, various strategies to support that, including schedule changes and flexibility in the overall way we plan and schedule teams, but also making a renewed commitment 
around honoring vacation requests, including at times bringing in what we call agency staff to make sure that we have enough staff in the building or the service area that our regular workers can also get some time away from work because we know that resiliency and recharging is important. The other thing that we are doing is appreciation. So trying to appreciate and recognize the hard work of the team. So we know that this county and the whole zone, but Picto in particular during Fiona was incredibly impacted. So one of the things that we did for the entire week of post-storm is every worker who came to work had the opportunity to get a hot meal free of charge every day that they walked into a shift. So we made that happen for them. They, they were showing up without power at home to care for people. You know, their families were at home without power, tree damage, all of the things that you all experienced, but they were still coming in and supporting patient care. So maybe seems like a small thing, but we received great feedback from the staff and physicians around the availability of those meals throughout the week. And so those are some examples. And uh, we, we know we need more uh, effort and focus there. And we constantly look for suggestions from our teams around that. I can speak to that a bit from a physician perspective as well. Um, sorry, yes, sorry. I'll hold it up. You got reminded of that. Thank you in the back. Um, I can speak to that from the physician perspective as well. Um, and you know, when we recruit, I'll go further and say, we don't recruit physicians, we recruit families. Um, and, and very often we're recruiting families, we're recruiting physicians and their partners, their husbands, their extended families. Sometimes that's from Canada, sometimes that's from Nova Scotia, oftentimes it's from all over the world. Um, and we have to ensure that we're supporting them as they come and support our system. So part of that work is ours as recruiters, and, and part of that work is really shared responsibility as a community to ensure that they're being supported in a way uh, that, that recognizes and supports diversity and inclusion. Um, the, the other part I think is really important is also working closely with, with our recruitees, our physicians, to understand how they want to practice and, and what's important to them um, and how we support that going forward. Um, and, and I think also is really working to engage physicians in other things that we know are positive factors for retention. So engaging um, in, in a sense of community and groups amongst our physician medical staff, um, making sure that uh, you know if they're interested, they can engage in, in teaching, um, engage in research, and also supporting them when they have ways they want to improve the system. So those are all ways that we can really contribute to retention on the physician side. Thanks for the question. And I would just say finally, um, certainly through our collective uh, bargaining process, so uh, the, many of our healthcare workers are unionized, and so we know that um, remuneration is really an important part of that. It's not all of it. We hear a lot about quality of life, so it's balancing those things as well. So we do have, um, you know, open dialogue. We try to stay very connected to the frontline staff, understanding what would work, what would work in Niels Harbour, may not would work in Amherst, you know, those types of things. But we are really committed, and, and recruitment is retention as well. So when you come on a regular basis and your staff, your shifts are fully staffed and your workload is manageable. So it, they kind of go together. It's retention and recruitment versus recruitment and retention, I guess is what I would say. So we are very worried about the staff too. They're tired uh, and you know they've been under a lot of pressure. So it, it is very much a top of mind uh, at the Nova Scotia Health Authority and also at the department. So I think I'm going to ask another submitted question. Oh, and then I'll get, I have another. So we had people that sent them maybe beforehand too. So I'm going to read one of those, if that's okay. Because it kind of fits with what you're discussing actually. So nursing recruitment strategies. Have you considered paying for nursing programs short term as an incentive for people to apply to the program? Or encourage LPNs to bridge to the RM program? In particular, a bridge. Uh, LPNs can't afford to pay for a program. I've lost a salary for two years. Surely with the amount of money spent in overtime and COVID over the last several years, this is a possibility. Long-term gains. So I'll start. Um, so there are a number of things. So laddering is really important. So what we want to do is look at folks who are currently in the system. A good example is nursing and another good example is paramedicine. So in terms of that uh, professional laddering, um, making it, you know, seeing that there's a clear pathway for continuing care assistance if they choose to become licensed practical nurses uh, or registered nurses or nurse practitioners so that there is a pathway for those who feel that they you know that is something that they would like to do similarly with paramedics um, 
There are primary care paramedics, PCPs. Uh, there is an opportunity to bridge them to advanced care paramedics, and then there's also a critical care paramedic as well. So making sure that those pathways are available to folks. Um, there is, in terms of nursing, there is a provincial nursing network, and, and those folks sit, so that would be some of the universities, Nova Scotia Community College, like, it's just kind of frontline staff, any variety of folks, and we do look at how do we support uh, nursing education. We have increased the number of seats that are available in um, both medicine and nursing programs. We have, uh, you know, pr trying to provide more opportunities. I think there's more work to do about that. Whoever asked that question, I'm not sure where you are, but there is more work to happen around that. I think we're in the early days of it. And we also have um, tuition relief programs as well. So there are some tuition relief programs through the federal government that support um, healthcare workers, particularly those who practice in rural environments. So, you know, we're early days. We're only, we're only 15 months in. It feels like a lifetime sometimes, but we are looking at some of those options to see how we best support our healthcare workers and, and uh, you know, enhance our workforce. Yeah, maybe just to add on to that. So we have a, a nursing strategy in Nova Scotia Health, and we review that periodically. And right now, we're about five years into our current strategy. It's presently under review. And so we're, we're currently looking at, you know, this option as well as others. But we do have uh, an LPN to RN kind of training incentive. It's not a full, uh, you know, coverage, but there is an incentive around this program. And so that is something that anyone who does have the interest on bridging up from LPN to RN um, can, can explore. We also have folks that move from RN to NP. Um, and so we also know that as they bridge, they, you know, they bring life and excitement into their into their team if they're working uh, part-time or when they come back with the new training that they have, we always look at the opportunity to kind of realign them to match their career uh, desires to keep keep growing. Yep. Thank you. Okay, it's in the, in the, in the back. <laughs> Yes, good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that all your initiatives are so commendable and I thank you very much. Um, you, you pretty much answered my question. It was to, tuition relief for uh, medical students and perhaps even going so far as to say, you know, let's sign a contract. You promise to stay here for a while or you get your tuition, you get your student loan back. So something along those lines. Thank you. So there is a bit of work happening, certainly in the rural communities. Um, we have the sign-on bonus, and so that replaced a number of different benefits that, you know, we've always been trying to kind of work with docs as well as other healthcare providers to find different ways to incent them. So there is work that is underway. We, you know, we're trying to, um, to find ways. We're, we are competing uh, with the world, and so, um, you know, part of what we have to offer here as well is, is, is our lifestyle. Uh, so we do attract people, particularly folks who have kind of a, uh, you know, like to be a bit outdoorsy as an example to some of our rural communities. So really working around finding, and the navigators on the ground in community are so essential to us, and we're really grateful to our partners, those community-based organizations that help us identify and recruit and understand what doctors and their families need. If you have more to say, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I will say it's an excellent idea, and, and we're already engaged in that work, so we have um, incentives for for physicians coming, and, and very often those incentives really incentivize rural work especially, um, and most times they come with a return to service commitment. Um, if you're interested in the details, I can connect with you after, and I can make sure you have all the information around what those programs are. Thanks. Okay. Oh, there it is. Hi, my name's Troy. Um, during the uh, pandemic, I never once heard Dr. Strain go on uh, TV or anything and talk about eating healthy or taking vitamin C, washing your hands, or whatnot. All I heard was wear an unhealthy mask, take a questionable vaccine. And so I'm wondering, um, I hear in your strategy that you're talking about health, um, healthy uh, lifestyles and stuff like that. I'm wondering if there's something that we can do uh, quicker to have Dr. Strain go on TV and say, eat healthy, get exercise. Um, these were things that I grew up knowing that this would keep me healthy, and I'm wondering what happened to that. How, how did we turn this corner that uh, a mask and vaccines and social distancing uh, trumped eating healthy, exercise, drinking water? So public health, you know, it's one of our strategies to really look at what are the, the, 
not only our own personal practices and our abilities, but also with the social determinants of health. So to your point, it really is all of us. I sometimes tell my cabinet colleagues my, um, that I'm the minister of the healthcare system and all of they are the ministers of health. So our education system, how we you know, support our youth, our agriculture industry, economic development, environment, all of those things are really what create health in our communities and that is the work of public health. And to hear that our public health colleagues are back working um, in those early years, the zero to seven years, to your point about your childhood, are the most important years that each of us has in our lives. It's such an important time for us, making sure that we have the things that we need, that we're loved and responded to, that we have the opportunities to get outside and play, that we you know, have healthy uh, relationships and we learn how to regulate emotionally. So all of that work is really essential in terms of us being healthy. And wherever possible, uh, you know, some folks don't have the same uh, opportunities or abilities to access healthy food and, and access, um, you know, safe environments to play in. So there is work happening in the department around poverty reduction and Minister Carla McFarlane has also uh, been tasked through her mandate to look at poverty reduction and, and how we do that across departments. So there is a lot of efforts around uh, preventative work that's happening not just in the Department of Health but across our, our particular our social, so housing um, and, uh, and Department of Community Services as well. So your point's well taken. Thank you. Yep, in the back. Good evening uh, and thank you for uh, what you brought to, uh, to, the, to the forum tonight. My name is Jim McKenna. I'm a retired social worker. And yesterday on uh, Facebook I saw that uh, there was an announcement uh, of an online program, uh, Tranquility, being offered for virtual coaching for people uh, to deal with cognitive behavioral therapy resources. I'm really concerned about this. It, it's uh, training people to be coaches when what they perhaps need is somebody with more skills than that. I would use the analogy that it would be similar to training people in first aid and CPR and having them work at the outpatient department. The people don't need coaches. They need more social workers. They need more therapists. Uh, I think coaching is fine. So is first aid for volunteers in the community but we wouldn't hire them to work in the outpatient department. We hire skilled people, and that's what we need more of. So um, what I would offer is that we have a continuum of services in the mental health and addictions program, right from wellness strategies, early support strategies, up through intervention. This is one of those tools that is in the like early part of the continuum where we're supporting people to help themselves stay well and use tools that are appropriate for that lower, lower acuity wellness and support stage. When they need treatment and intervention, then they come in through uh, the system for you know, an intake assessment matching to the right care level that they need to support their concerns. So this is a, it was a program that was vetted uh, to ensure that it was meeting the need that it was um, designed for a certain population. It's certainly not going to meet the needs of all, but it's important to have various available options for different folks. Uh, some will find this very helpful, others may not find it meets their needs, and that's why we have the mental health centralized intake line, crisis supports, inpatient and outpatient services available as well. And can, I just also, can I just also mention, you're right, we need more folks to be doing this uh, important work. And so that is part of the recruitment that we need. We need to look at you know, how do we support clinical therapists across a variety of different designations, right? So social work, um, psychology, clinical therapists, so we, uh, psychiatry, right? So we need to have a continuum. How do we leverage the skill set of our mental health nurses as an example, so those that are trained? Um, our community-based uh, support. So, so there is a commitment. Our government's been clear. We do have a Minister of Addictions and Mental Health for the first time. Uh, and we're looking at how do we bring universal mental health care as well so that it is more accessible uh, to people in communities. And so there is a lot of work that's happening. And so I'm really grateful that you brought that up today to highlight it. We have more to do. But I will say that we're, we're very devoted to that file. And, and we continue to look at different ways to improve uh, mental health care for people in the province. Thank you. Okay. Andrew again. 
He had done a good job on reducing the strain on our health care system by allowing nurses and pharmacists to do more. There's another group who is just as qualified, if not more qualified, who can make a big difference in reducing the strain on the system. They are the naturopathic and the homeopathic doctors. Their talents are being underutilized and would be a great benefit to our society. So currently uh, in this province, naturopaths are um, generally only available through um, a private insurance companies. Uh, and we are doing some work around regulations to better understand the role of the different health care providers uh, in the province. So thank you for your comments. I appreciate them. Yeah. Okay, and, and I'm looking at the clock, and I, I'm, the last few that we've done, we get really close to the end of time, and then like everybody's hand goes up in the last five minutes, so if you're thinking, we have lots of submitted questions I can read, but if you're thinking about a question you'd like to ask, just I will read one of the submitted questions, but just ponder in the next 10 minutes that if you have one that you want to ask, um, if you put your hand up more quickly, then you're more likely, we had, uh, I think it was... Uh, Monday night that we had like at the very last minute like six people put their hands up and so we can't we couldn't get to them all unfortunately but um, so yeah if you're thinking of one so this question is uh, doctors have been using EMRs for many years in the province is OPOR which is one person one record expected to replace EMRs or will it communicate interface with the existing EMRs so an EMR is an electronic medical record, and the, I'm looking at the docs in the room here. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about OPOR, and then I'll let uh, Dr. Smith talk about the EMR. So we are committed to one patient, one record. So one patient, one record would be um, a way for all of our healthcare system in the acute care system to talk to one another. So right now, maybe you go to a clinic, and it's a paper-based clinic, and that file sits on a shelf. And so if you come to the emergency room because you've seen a doc or, or a professional in a clinic, there's really no way for the healthcare workers in all jurisdictions to see what happened to you in that clinic today. And that might be really telling. And maybe, for whatever reason, you're not able to fully articulate what happened in the clinic that day. So we are committed to this one patient, one record, so that we, and the other thing is for those of you that, that have had to uh, tell your story four or five or six or seven times, it really wears you down sometimes. You have to say the same thing again and again. So we do, we are looking at one patient, one record. It will create um, a better communication system and, and our hope is that's, that you'll be able to actually have your record or a good portion of it uh, on an app at very, not super soon, but soon. Like we want you, we kind of call it like democratizing our healthcare. So here you are with your record, you know, you're better able to navigate the system because you have your blood work and your primary care provider has your blood work. You have your, you know, your results. You can kind of say here, this is what happened. So it is really an important step. It's a huge recruitment tool. So it really is important that when we bring doctors in from particularly from other um, provinces, they really are looking for that one patient, one record. And we heard about it a lot on our tour. So that is moving forward. Uh, and, and also uh, pre-hospital care folks, like we have all these little systems and it sometimes feels like a tin can and a string, like, you know, paper charts tucked under feet on the end of stretchers and then we have this and that. So we need to modernize and we are committed to that. Yeah. If I could speak to that a little bit. Um, <laughs> I can speak to that a little bit, um, you know, from, from my experience as a health system leader, but also as a primary care provider. Um, and, and I will say emphatically, I believe the future of quality care is digital. Um, and I'm not saying or suggesting that we could or should replace face-to-face -face interactions. And in fact, we, we absolutely can't. However, what is very important is that providers have the data they need to make uh, rational and, and quality decisions with, with patients. Um, and a tool such as OPOR will help provide us with the information we need uh, and inform our discussions and our decisions along with patients. And, and I'm very happy to hear about the democratizing health. Um, you know, your, your health care data and your health record is really yours. And, and, and the health system or providers are keepers of that information, but you really own it. And, and if you have access to it in a way that you can understand and you can use, it's really going to help you obtain and get more, uh, sorry, better quality care and understand the care that you're provided. So, so I do believe the future is digital, and I do believe a tool such as OPOR is absolutely necessary to, to, to continue to provide quality health care in this province. Thanks. 
the Thank other you. Thing, oh, Sorry. It's okay, Nancy. The other thing I would add on, on that is um, the information that we can gain from a, a system like one person, one record gives us great information to make then evidence-based decisions about changes within the system. So we had the opportunity back uh, in the early summer. Uh, the minister was invited to present at a conference in Denmark and myself and CEO Oldfield accompanied her and we spent the week um, traveling within, just within Copenhagen, but going to different parts of their healthcare system to learn about what they did. And we spent one afternoon with a primary healthcare provider. We spent time at their EHS system. And one thing that we learned there is they have a very rich data system there because the way that they operate in that country is everyone has essentially one number. So if you think of your social insurance number, that would also be your health card number. It's kind of an easy way to, to think of it. So everyone's data is attached to that and they have 50 plus years of data. Yeah, and they have this app that you have on your phone where your lab results come to, where, they're, where your uh, appointments are scheduled. And these so we really learned a lot about the possibilities of having that data, and that's one of the other things that a system like One Person, One Record would, be, would bring to us, is to be able to have that rich data to allow us to make decisions for the system. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, see, this is exactly what I said. This is what happened. So we'll go one, two, oh, three, because I think you had yours up. So, and then four, if we get to four, and if not, please, if we don't get to, I, just, I say it before we start, just write it on your card, and I promise someone will get in touch with you with your questions. Hi, I work for a uh, community-based uh, healthcare agency uh, providing both nursing and home support services in Pictou County. And, you know, there's, all kinds of great retention recruitment strategies going on, but one of the things that we really do need to concentrate on in community is the availability of equipment mm -hmm. to care for clients. Um, we are seeing more acutely ill and more clients with a heavier need in community now more than ever, and we can't source beds. We can't source lifts. We can't source you know, the basic equipment to to apply a pair of support stockings. And this is where our workforce is going, is off to injury. Um, and we, we've seen more and more of it in recent years. So I think there really needs to be a concentration and, a, and an effort put towards acceptable equipment used in community, the same as we would see in hospitals. You would never see a nurse or a CCA in a hospital kneeling on floor to apply a bandage or reaching over a bed to reach for something for the client. You would see them using acceptable safety equipment, and this is not something that's available in community. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, that responsibility does sit under seniors in long-term care around home care, and Minister Adams uh, is, a pharma is a physiotherapist, so she's quite attuned to that. So. Um, I'm just trying to remember, we did give a substantial amount of money to Red Cross to purchase more equipment uh, to, as a support for community. And just recently there was a new uh, home lift program, and I don't know if you've seen that, where you can get um, some a home lift available to the point of really how do we enhance our community-based care, including equipment, to support people living in their homes longer, which is what we hear people really do want to do. So it also, when we look at that equipment, we need to look at safe work conditions as well. And I know that, um, you know, making sure that we have the right skill set and the right number of people in the home for the care that's required. So there is work underway happening around that. And if you want to chat afterwards around some of the challenges that you have, I can, you know, we'll, we'll get that information from you to see if we can do anything to support. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Maddie Stanton and I'm a, I'm not a medical care worker don't know much about the system. I do know that a lot of us don't have family doctors. Well, I do currently, but I'm not going to soon. So it's becoming a pressing issue. I first, before I ask my question, I do want to thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, all the different initiatives that, that are underway sound amazing. And I really wish you well and that they all, they all help Nova Scotians. Um, but I'm wondering what can be done to encourage more medical students to choose family physician specialty over in the first place over other specialties I, I'm, I'm not sure 
if it's correct or not, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I gather that fewer and fewer med students are choosing family practice as their specialty, partly because it is a specialty now where it didn't used to be, and it's costing them more money and they don't earn enough in the end to, and then they have the added financial burden of running a business instead of working in a hospital, which is publicly funded. So I'm, I'm concerned about that and I, I just wondered if, if you're looking at ways or working with licensing bodies to try and uh, figure out ways that can make family practice more attractive to medical students. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I mean, I can, I can respond to this. Um, it, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, and, and I'll put the disclaimer, I may be slightly biased on this as well, um, <laughs> because I think, I think family practice is where it's at. Um, the, I, I agree with you, though, is, is um, and this is where my, maybe my bias comes out, Family practice, in, in terms of medical specialties, is really a foundation of our system, right? And it's the foundation of the Canadian system. It's the gate through most of us have to pass to access the services we need and maintain our health. Um, and I think you're right to, to, to voice your concern about what are we doing to encourage more physicians to, to go into that model. Um, so we're working hard at that. We're working hard at that. Um, one of the things we do, and I keep harping on teaching, and I apologize, I sound like a parrot. Uh, one of them is to make sure that medical students um, have, have exposure to family medicine in their training years. So um, making sure that, that we're supporting teachers uh, uh, across the province and in this zone to have undergraduate medical students do placements uh, in, in especially in rural communities and family practice so they understand what it's like and what the benefits are and, and how rewarding it can be um, before they get to the point where they have to make the decisions about the rest of their life in, in terms of the residency and training. So that's one really important thing. I think the other really important thing to that too is, is really thinking and being intentional about what you know, the next generation of family practice wants. Um, do they want to, you know, the old model would be that the family physician has their office and their own staff and, and, and they're there for the rest of their lives providing care. And, and what we know now really is that's not what people want. Um, people want to practice in a team, right? They want to be supported. And they want to practice in a team of not just physicians. You know, they want to practice with nurses and they want to practice with pharmacists. And they want to practice with social workers and they want to be supported in that. Um, and oftentimes, too, um, new graduates don't necessarily want to be in the, the business end of, 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 of family medicine. Um, they want to provide the care, uh, but they want to be in a supportive environment where they can do so. So we're really working to build collaborative, um, you know, turnkey practices, and we have, we have a lot of them in this zone. And um, we're also making sure that we're strengthening and stabilizing teams. Um, we're making sure that we're, we're reaching out to, to medical schools, both, uh, you know, in Nova Scotia and Canada and internationally. Um, and um, we're really encouraging teaching. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful um, that, that that will continue to kind of turn the ship a little bit and get more and more people interested in family medicine. So thank you for the question. Yeah, I think the other things that I would add are, and Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the minister had uh, spoken earlier about the 10 new residency seats that are for Nova Scotians returning who are internationally trained, and those are all family medicine residency seats. So starting next, the intake for fall 2023, we will have 10 additional family medical residents in the province. So that is big, that is, that is very big. I think the other thing picking up on Dr. Smith's comment about how uh, we know people wanna practice now, we also know that payment models matter in how they get paid, right? That traditionally, the person who started their practice, worked there for their whole entire career, worked fee for service. Uh, we know that that's also not how newer physicians want to be paid. So we do have alternative payment models that we um, cur we currently have and that we're piloting new ones as well. So it's a it's a number of different strategies, but I think it com keeps coming back to we know that the newer graduates do not want to practice in the same manner. And so yet again, it's just another example of, it's, it's gonna be different, right? That it, it might not be going to your family physician for every appointment that you have. You might be going to your health home and you might see the nurse practitioner one time and you might see the doctor another time or you might see the dietitian the next time. So it's just that really, but it's about making sure that we're getting you the care that you need when you need it. I'm just gonna add one last thing. 
it's really around the scope of practice as well. So we, we talk a little bit about um, having all these different healthcare professionals and if we stick to the way that we've always done it, um, you know, Karen uses a good example that we're able to do this much care. So a nurse only does this and a doctor and the, but when we do everybody's scope, it stretches the care this much and we can do this much with the same team. So really looking at how do we complement one another. And I would say too, I, I see, um, I've been a nurse for 30 years and so I see now physicians who typically would work only in their offices, but they might want to do half office and they might want to deliver babies as, you know, you know, do a little bit of obstetrical care or they want to do some palliative care or they want to work, um, you know, on the mobile unit as an example. So giving people kind of that opportunity to, to not only work in family practice, but also do something else. It, it gives them more versatility and I think that's really important for us to do. And, and when we bring, there, we also have doctors like my, I was told, grow up, get a job, get a family, don't change. <laughs> but people want to change now. So it's important too as we explore um, an Atlantic license, we may, to the, to the deputy's point, you know, you have a health home, but we have physicians or nurse practitioners who want to work on a locum basis. So they're going to come in for a few weeks and then maybe they're going to Newfoundland for a few weeks because they want to experience different things at different times. And so what's important is we anchor you where your health home and your information is there and you know you can get care and we bring in the folks as you need them and when you have your record on your phone or however you want to use it you also become a very active participant in your care in a way that maybe wasn't capable you weren't capable of before yeah so lots happening Thank you, and and I know, and I'm sorry because it's it's almost nine, and we try to to, and I know we have a couple of outstanding questions, so I, and I guess I'm just curious. I guess if it's a, a a a quick question, if if we have a time for one, and if not, if you think it might be a lengthy question, we get you to write it down. So I guess I give that to you. If uh, we have only have five minutes left, so keep it short. Um, the, the response to COVID showed a very severe. Uh, abandonment of medical ethics. Um, people were told to get the jab, to wear a mask, or they'd lose their job, they'd lose access to certain things. And, and, and that, that really is criminal extortion. Uh, when are you going to call for an investigation into the conduct of officials that, that relegated this stuff on people? Instead of you sitting back and refusing to answer questions, saying you're not changing policy, or the gentleman asked about the face masks that uh, you're not prepared to, to argue with the science. Uh, we need an investigation to, to, to solve this and make sure it never happens again and hold people accountable that, that did really nasty things to people against ethics and against law. It, it violated charter rights, it violated the Bill of Rights, it, 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 it killed the, the concept of informed consent. So, so what are you going to do about this? So I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to ask for an investigation. What we are here tonight is to talk about transforming healthcare and action for health and how we're trying to strengthen and change the healthcare system to be more responsive to folks' needs. So that's my purview today. Thank you, Minister Thompson. And that really is, I think, the final question. And, and whenever we, an we end these events, I always, always end it with um, a thank you to everyone for coming. And as I said earlier, it was so nice to see a, a good crowd from this community. And as my home community, it makes me feel very proud that we have so many people here. Um, and I also want to say how brave it is for people to come out and ask the questions that are hard questions and to, to, to spend the time to think about thoughtful questions and equally, the courage it takes to come and sit in front of a group of people not having any idea what questions might be asked and being willing to put yourself out and answer those questions. So I think, uh, I think that it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to be part of this for the last couple of weeks. So thank you for that. And, and with that, um, again, just to remind you that if you want to watch the video later, it will be where you signed up. And uh, safe travels. And thanks again, everyone, for coming. <laughs>